Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am thrilled to bring you Mark Solms. Mark is a psychoanalyst and neuropsychologist. He holds the chair of neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and he is also the research chair of the International Psychoanalytical Association. We talk about in this conversation his new book, The Hidden Source, which is absolutely fantastic. And we start the conversation by talking about his background, how he got introduced into neuropsychology, and then how he started uh, becoming more interested in psychoanalysis and how he merges those two worlds together. He talks about how he became interested in brainstem arousal and affect, and then this led him to be able to work with the late, great Jock Panksepp. Um, so we start by talking about sensory aspects within our experiential field and how that you know, integrates with perception and activates in the cortex. But then we get down to the brainstem. And this is kind of a central thesis for Solms on how we understand consciousness and feelings and affect um, from the brainstem, particularly the midbrain and the regions in the midbrain, as the source of consciousness. We also talk about um, some of Panksepp's work with the seven affective states. We have a really nice bit in the, in the conversation about drives versus instincts versus affect versus emotion versus feeling. There's a lot of confusion on these terms, even within the world of psychology and with mental health clinicians and psychiatrists. And so um, it was a really nice, instructive kind of bit of the conversation where he kind of explains kind of the breakdown of that. We talk about Freud's topographical map of the human mind with his understanding of conscious and unconscious and how we can sort of understand subcortical and cortical levels of the brain as also kind of mapping onto this kind of, you know, loose sketching of, of uh, what Freud had initially tried to uh, set out. We talk about his work in particular and how he's continued on from Panksepp's work and trying to understand how consciousness and feelings are implicated with, with humans. We... We have a bit of a conversation about, you know, how consciousness works in humans, but how this could translate wider to different animals, other mammals and other vertebrates. We also talk about um, free will, right? Uh, his whole kind of framing and structure of this has a different angle and spin on, on free will and the aspect of choice. And we also talk about homeostasis as a really key part to some of the different forms in which consciousness takes out, namely in acting and adjusting. Um, we talk about proprioception, exterioceptive and interoceptive qualities. And then we, we also talk about, um, towards, sort of towards the end, um, some of the critiques of Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's one of the primary um, researchers in psychology in the world and has done tremendous work within emotional theory. And, you know, Mark is very charitable in his critiques and he's, you know, wanting to definitely say like, you know, look, I don't think we're in opposition. I think both things can be true. And, you know, just sometimes there's a little bit of a breakdown in kind of the semantics of, you know, kind of what people are discussing. So he was, he was very kind in his uh, critiques of some of her work. And we kind of end the conversation talking about, you know, there, there's an overemphasis on, uh, cognitive science and how we understand the brain or intelligence or just humans. And, you know, he is very much a champion of, well, how do we understand affective states? How do we understand feelings? How do we understand it's connected to consciousness? And how do we understand that overall for, for the total kind of human? I can't say enough, uh, how awesome this conversation was. Um, and how generous he was to give me two hours of his time. Um, I definitely could have talked with him about so many things, you know, continued to, you know, go over ideas about all of this stuff. And uh, so I, I was really, really pleased with how this conversation uh, turned out. And I'm excited for everyone to be able to, to listen and learn from his uh, many, many, many uh, treasures that he has to give to us. So now I bring you Mark Solms. I am here with Mark Solms. Mark, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Great pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So you've written a wonderful new book, 
Um, I, which, which book is this for you, actually? You've written a few. This is your latest one. Yes, I think it's number eight. <laughs> wow. I knew you had a few. I didn't know you had eight. Wow, that's great. That's great. Um, so tell, it's fantastic, and I can't wait to get into all the, the details of it. So just tell listeners a little bit, just kind of your, you know, your elevator pitch, your 30-second, you know, who you are and what you do and, and your background and, and what you're currently uh, uh, researching and, and doing in clinical practice. Um, well, so uh, my, my name's Mark Solms. Uh, I'm a professor in neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town. Um, what what sets me apart from most of my uh, peers is that I also trained as a psychoanalyst, which is not what one is supposed to do as a neuroscientist. <laughs> um, my, my, my early research was on brain mechanisms of dreaming. Um, and then from there, I, I, I researched brain mechanisms of emotion. And that led me to my current uh, focus, which is which is consciousness. No, that's great. That's great. And tell us for so your new book, which I'll put in the notes and everything is the hidden spring journey to the source of consciousness. What motivated you to write it? It's fantastic, by the way, but what motivated you to, to write it? Well, I mean, there are long versions and short versions of an answer to that question. The, the, the short version is that I, I, I thought that uh, I've, I've come to understand something uh, rather differently from uh, the mainstream view, and I wanted to communicate that. Um, it's, it is, in a very real sense, though, the culmination of my life's work, because as I summarized a moment ago, uh, I started out studying brain mechanisms of sleep and dreaming, uh, which, of course, has to do with you know, consciousness intruding into the unconsciousness of sleep. Um, and then I moved on to brain mechanisms of emotion, because it turns out that Dreaming is generated by a, 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 a circuit which arises from the reticular activating system of the brainstem, but which has powerful uh, affective feelings associated with it. So that got me interested in feeling, you know, the role that, that feelings and affects play uh, in the economy of mental life and, uh, and, and ultimately to the realization that they are the fundamental form of consciousness. So, so when I say that this book is the culmination of my life's work, uh, it, it really is in retrospect, one can see that this is where I was heading, even though it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an intentional path. No, no, that's great. That's great. I, I'll, I'll tell you real quick, uh, when I was looking to do my dissertation in my doctorate program, um, I wanted to do like everything all at once. And my chairwoman said, no, 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 no. We can't do that. No, we want to just, <laughs> we want to get you out of here and get you graduated if you want to do that after. And so for a little bit, I wanted to, to do work on dreams. And uh, I thought it was super fascinating. And um, from a, you know, brain behavior, neuropsychological element of understanding the mechanisms for it. And it got too overwhelming and I was too ambitious and uh, I'm grateful that she told me not to because it would have been, you know, I never would have graduated probably. It's very complicated. Um, so I, I, I'm sympathetic to that. Yeah, dreams are terribly fascinating. Um, it's got some, again, a fascinating history both in the neuropsych literature and, and elsewhere. So that's wonderful. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's start by... You've already alluded to it, so let's go a little bit uh, deeper here. So, yeah, so you have a really curious hybrid, which, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest, makes me very happy. Tell me, how do you have psychoanalysis and neuropsychology uh, colliding in your world? How do you, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Most neuropsychologists, if they're doing clinical practice or if they're doing some type of therapy, they're usually doing some type of behaviorism or cognitive behavioral therapy. Psychoanalysis is like a whole other world. And how, how did that collision happen for you? And how do you make them work? So um, I said uh, to your previous question, there's a long and a short version of an answer. I, I'm afraid in this instance, I have to give you a long uh, please. answer. <clears throat> please, please. Well, um, my, my interest in the brain uh, started with a tragedy in my childhood. My, my older brother fell off a building onto his head and sustained a brain injury. And so I witnessed uh, sort of very early in life, I was only four years old, um, the fact that our minds, and by minds I don't mean our cognition, I mean you know the person, 
My brother was changed as a person fundamentally. Um, when he came back from the hospital, he looked the same, but he was not the same. It uh, radically changed. So the fact that this was the result of the injury to his brain uh, got me thinking earlier than most of us would about this, this incredibly profound mystery as to how can it be that I, like my brother, you know, we uh, sentient beings are also just this bodily organ. Um, and so it's not as if at the age of four decided, okay, I'll become a neuropsychologist, <laughs> but it's pretty clear that that is, you know, what, what was the impetus to my trying to um, later on in life, you know, to grapple with uh, the, the, this, 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 this conjunction. But when I went to study, um, in which was in the early 1980s, uh, to study neuropsychology, I was rather frustrated. Uh, if you accept that my motivation was that deeply personal one of needing to understand how can it be that my brother was no longer my brother, you know, no longer the same personality, no longer the same uh, person. Um, what I learned, as we all do uh, in neuropsychology, is, is about the functional sort of mechanisms of memory and perception and voluntary action and executive control and all of that. But there was no, no sort of sense, especially those days, because things have improved somewhat. But in those days, you know, 40 years ago, um, there was no talk uh, uh, at all in, in neuropsychology about the self and, uh, and consciousness uh, in the sense of, you know, experiencing what it is like to be this information processing device. Um, even emotions were not on the, you know, we just didn't study those things. Mm -hmm. So, so it was out of a sense of frustration that, you know, what had motivated me to study the brain was precisely this unique property that it feels like something to be a brain, unlike anything else, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the world. Uh, and yet that was the aspect that was being left out. We were studying the brain in much the same way as we might study the heart or the liver, you know, just understanding its 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 functional architecture uh, via its physiology and so on and and frankly when i asked my professors questions about you know but you know but where do feelings come from and you know where's the self that receives all this information and so on they they sort of kindly it, it discouraged me from asking such questions and pointed out to me that, you know, mm. one should not ask such things. That's bad for your career. Mm. You know, to, to, to. So it was, uh, it was, it, it was a, a sort of an act of desperation that mm. I, 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 I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to study the things that really interest me about the brain, then I need to go look elsewhere for where can we, where do we take subjective experience seriously, the lived life of the mind. And so, you know, of course, I can tell you many more details, but the nub of it is that that's what that's what drove me to to uh, train in psychoanalysis to learn their methods, their to, uh, concepts, uh, their theories, which are attempts with all of their faults. They are serious, concerted attempts to conceptualize and study um, and understand um, the mechanisms underlying subjective. Um, mental life. And then my task was to bring that into neuroscience. You know, it wasn't that I just jumped ship and became a psychoanalyst. My, my, my aim was to take a detour through psychoanalysis to bring the psyche back into neuropsychology. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. And uh, how, how was that received? I, I'm sure everyone in, in neuro neuropsychology was, you know, Welcoming you with open arms, weren't they? Was say, yes, bring us Freud and bring us uh, <laughs> bring us all of the uh, the aspects of analysis, or or no, not quite that way. Maybe maybe. How was it received when you came back with that? You know, I trained in London in psychoanalysis, uh, and the training uh, happens in the evenings because mm -hmm. most people uh, they sort of specialize in psychoanalysis when they're already in clinical practice as psychotherapists or psychiatrists or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was working uh, by day. Uh, I was an honorary lecturer in neurosurgery at the Royal London Hospital. And um, by night, I was training inside. It was really like a Jekyll and Hyde existence. Yeah, yeah. And I was young. I, I, was, I was in my mid-20s or, or late 20s, let me think. Yeah, I was in my late 20s. And um, 
So I, I, I literally hid the one side of my life from the other. You know, I, I didn't go and broadcast uh, to my neurosurgical colleagues that I'm training in psychoanalysis. Um, but uh, what I did do uh, as I uh, gradually mastered th those uh, techniques and, and theories and so on, is I, I, I brought it into my clinical work because also I should have mentioned, because of what happened to my brother, I suspect, I also didn't want only to be a scientist. I also wanted to be a clinician. I wanted to, to, to uh, so I, I am, I do clinical work, uh, both diagnostic and therapeutic work with neurological patients. Mm -hmm. So in my, in my therapeutic work, and indeed, actually, I would say in my diagnostic work, in the sense that you get a better, and you know, we aren't only cognitive machines. So when our brains are injured, we don't only have cognitive deficits. You know, it's a huge blow to the whole, um, the whole sort of being of the patient. And the cognition and the emotions interact with each other in complicated ways. So that if you do take seriously the emotional side of things, you get a better grip on what's going on. And also the emotional, the, the sort of functional um, uh, response of the person as a whole to their cognitive deficits is the part that you can treat. You can't, you can't replace what cognitive hardware is missing, but you can deal with the way in which the patient responds to that. And, 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 and it's, not, it's not a sort of detail, a little add-on. You know, they're very complex ways in which these things interact with each other. So the point of this, uh, what I'm really trying to get to saying is, that my colleagues uh, at the hospital, and, and as I said, I was a lecturer, so I was actually in the medical school based in the hospital. Um, they, they started to see that what I was doing was was um, helpful, you know. So I didn't I didn't label it as psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. I, it, it was just you know I'm I'm I think it's important that we take the person of, of the patient seriously, and I think that this aspect you know we can help with and so on. So that was when I was young, and then I gradually gathered courage, you know, to come out of the closet, as it were, uh, and start. <laughs> and that was because I was publishing then right. on my findings. And it was, I have to, sorry, I'm, I'm probably over, over elaborating no, no, no. my answer. But no, 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 no. I want to tell you that um, although I have, uh, as you correctly surmise, suffered enormous resistance from my neuroscientific mm -hmm. colleagues, and I still do to this day, mm -hmm. Um, it, the, the resistance on the other side was greater. Psychoanalysts' resistance to um, me bringing neuroscientific methods and, and knowledge to bear on their beloved uh, you know, theories, uh, it was much more strongly resisted. It was as if I was a kind of Trojan horse you know, who was bringing in the, the enemy you know, into, their, into their cathedral of subjectivity. Uh, yeah, that's... That is a little surprising to me. Say a little bit more. Why? That's very strange. I mean, in one way, I guess I could see it sort of why they would have some resistance to that. But why do you think that is? Well, I, I, I think as with so many things, it's not one single reason. But I'll tell you what I think is the main one. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience at the time that I studied, uh, which was early 1980s onwards, as, as, the, as my career developed, uh, it was during a period, uh, what can only be called a golden age for neuroscience. Yeah. You know, remember yeah. Clinton's yeah. decade of the brain and all of yeah, that. Yeah, 90s was, was huge for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I think if you're, if you're on the up, you can be generous and you can be, you know, open-minded and you can say, well, you know, bring that on too. Let's see. <laughs> uh, whereas psychoanalysis was in the opposite trajectory. Mm. It was increasingly uh, uh, marginalized and, and uh, beleaguered and precisely by the rise of biological psychiatry and neuroscience. So uh, I think that they really saw it as the enemy. And now I'm, you know, bringing it into, into their, uh, you know, uh, into their... Their, their, their holy of holies. Into their, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was like I was, a, I was the, the, the... That's why I say Trojan horse. I was mm -hmm. like a foreign body within... Uh, and clearly not to be trusted because I stand for the other side. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I can see that. I um, as much as you want to share, I mean, if it's you know personal or whatever, you don't have to. But what what were you seeing that were the changes? I guess for your 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 brother. So it sounds like he had at least a, a moderate to severe TBI, as what it sounds at the very least. So what were the 
the changes that you were like, this is, yeah, the same person. It's, you know, uh, uh, his, you know, same body, same everything, but, you know, it, almost like a, sh a shift. W w just maybe some of the major pieces that were like, whoa, like this feels like a different person in, in the interior. How, how was the uh, big things like that? Yeah. Well, um, because I was only four years old, I don't have a, a continuous uh, narrative memory of, of, sure. of, I have snapshots. Sure, sure. So, uh, for example, I mean, to, to, I'm sorry to start with something as crude as this, but you remember he's my older brother, mm -hmm. uh, and yet he lost his developmental milestones. So, for example, mm -hmm. he was enuretic and encopretic. Mm -hmm. You know, to have your older brother not being able to control his bladder and bowels is a is a you know for a little child that's your your, your own recent achievement you know only yeah. only two years on are you out of nappies and all of that mm -hmm. so that was a shock about big brother you know and and he's uh, you know he's 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 lost that developmental uh, ability mm -hmm. but um another snapshot was we used to play i mean he was i should mention we, we grew up in a small town um, and uh, we were very close. You know, we, we, we weren't part of a large network of friends. We were pretty much each other's friends as much as we were brothers. So we played a lot together and um, a lot of games. And our, our father ran a, administered a, a diamond mine. And uh, so one of the games we played was diamond mining. You know, we, <laughs> we, we, had, we had these little toy earth moving machines and we dug holes, you know, which were, which were our mining the diamond reefs. And, and then we would find the, uh, you know, stones underneath the, the topsoil and those would be our, the shiny ones were our diamonds and et cetera, et cetera. Just sort of like recreating in our garden, the impressive open cast mines that our, that our father, you know, yeah. showed us. And, uh, that's before the accident. After the accident, you know, I said, Lee, let's go and play diamond mining, you know, it's like, for example, one of the games, the one that I've just told you about. Mm. And for him, it had, the game had become digging holes. Mm. It was, you know, okay, let's, let's do that. And then it was like, yes, we just dug holes. And all of the imaginative, symbolic, mm. you know, the, the stories, uh, the fantasies about yeah, what we, yeah. who we were, what, we, what this thing stood for, what the, all of that was gone. Mm. So he became much more concrete. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's hard to convey in a few words like this, but the feeling was one of bewilderment. I mean, like, what? You know, how, I mean, sure, yeah. What's going on here, you know? And, um, and then there were also cognitive things. Um, I mean, more um, like my father, I remember my father uh, buying him a wristwatch and um and sa and saying i'm going to give you this watch as soon as as soon as you've learned to tell the time uh and uh my, you know, we were sitting in this in, in the sitting room uh, my, my father was teaching my brother what the shorthand means what the longhand means you know mm -hmm. and he just wasn't getting it so my father would say okay the shorthand is pointing toward the nine the longhand toward the 12 so what time is that and my brother was you know unable to answer and then I would shout from across the room you know that's nine o'clock mm -hmm. and my father would say be quiet mm -hmm. you know and uh, th th this kind of experience of you know he's my older brother and I can get this you know why doesn't he get it mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and then also the emotional aspects of it you know my my father then eventually gave him the watch even though he hadn't properly got it and I remember thinking, well, where's my watch? You know, mm -hmm. I'm the one who really can tell the time. And then that later on developed into much more complicated feelings, you know, rather than feeling uh, aggrieved, I started to feel really guilty because everything that, you know, that came so easily to me uh, was really a source of great difficulty and, and pain for him. He, he also had the usual, you know, he became much more emotionally irascible, uh, disinhibited, uh, fr frankly violent, yeah. uh, with me at yeah. times because you know, it was. You can imagine how frustrating it was for him to have this upstart of a little brother overtaking him in so many ways. So you know that gives you the, the sort of a sense of the flavor of it. Yeah, no, no, that's that's really you know kind of a captivating narrative that you have about the differences. And I, I mean, I mean, this is huge. I mean, I mean, we can't even say an imprint. I mean, that kind of also changed his life but it sounds like it changed your life as well especially since you guys were really close and so that that 
again, I mean, that, that the, the impact at least that would have would, it's not surprising that you would be curious about, well, how does this, how does the brain work, right? And, and then how do we understand the person, right? And the self that's there. And so, um, so, fa- so fast forwarding then, so you, you finish your work and you're, you, you finish analysis training and you're doing, and how did you, how did you end up uh, working with the, the legendary, the late, great uh, Jack Panksett? So um, when I, my, the, I have to tell you something about the research I was doing at that stage. Please. Uh, Please. I, I was interested, as I've already told you, in brain mechanisms of dreaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and the study that I was doing, we all knew those days. Remember, we're talking about the 1980s. We all knew, uh, you know, dreaming happens during REM sleep. REM sleep is generated by uh, sort of cholinergic cells in the mesopontine tegmentum of the brainstem, part of the reticular activating system, mm-hmm. um, and which activates the forebrain with its cortex, which then generates all this random imagery, which is the dream. Yep. Um, I, I, I didn't question any of that. Uh, I, was, I was interested, uh, however, in the, um, what happens at the cortical end. You know, so I, I took a large series of patients, uh, 360 odd patients mm-hmm. with lesions uh, and, and studied systematically the effect of those lesions on the, on the quality, the content of their dreams. And my, my predictions were, uh, you know, things, obvious things like patients who are cortically blind won't see anything in their mm-hmm. dreams. Patients who have broker's aphasia won't be able to speak in their mm-hmm. dreams. Mm-hmm. Patients with right hemiplegias will be hemiplegic in their dreams, you know, and so on. In other words, I thought that I was trying to see what do the the different parts of the cortex do uh, in the assembly of the the content of dreams. I had some interesting hypotheses, like I, I, I expected that dorsolateral prefrontal convexity, which is sort of to, to, to put it over simply, you know, sort of where the agency of the mind uh, resides, our mental control over um, mm-hmm. our, 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 our thought processes and feelings. I thought, well, you know, that's lacking in dreams. We don't have volition and, and th- the dreams sort of happen to us. Right. We are not in command. So I thought, well, maybe with prefrontal lesions, uh, the, the, the dream won't be so affected. Maybe dreams are this. And as it happens, that is true. Dreams of prefrontal patients uh, blind raters can't tell them apart from your and my dreams. Yeah. Um, so those were the sorts of things that interested me. Now, the point is that, as you can see, I was looking at the cortex. I wanted to see, you know, what is... But what I found were totally unexpectedly two things. The one was that patients with lesions in the mesopontine tegmentum and patients who lost REM sleep nevertheless carried on dreaming. So that was a completely unexpected, uh, fortuitous uh, discovery um, that that REM sleep and dreaming must in fact be generated by different mechanisms. Mm. The lesion that led to loss of dreaming with preservation of REM sleep, in other words, I was able to show there's a double dissociation. Lesions which lead to loss of REM sleep, uh, dreaming persists, and then there's a separate lesion where, where, where you have a loss of dreaming where REM sleep persists. Now, that lesion site was in the uh, sort of ventromesial frontal white matter. In other words, the white matter of the frontal lobes just underneath the anterior horns of, of the lateral ventricles. Mm-hmm. And um, that's in the forebrain. You know? So my, my, whole, um, my initial excitement about my findings was, look, Hobson, you're wrong. You know, <laughs> dreams aren't just driven by brainstem um, sort of uh, 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 clockwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, they 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 they, they uh, are centrally involved uh, in, uh, in in upper you know in, in forebrain uh, mechanisms and what is more motivated ones because that part of the brain where the lesion was it interrupts the the, the mesocortical mesolimbic dopamine system which has everything to do with motivation and emotion and mm-hmm. psyche you know, so I was trying to uh, resuscitate a kind of mentalistic conception of dreams, that dreams are psychological, they're, they're not just you know, physiological clockwork, uh, that they are uh, motivations, they are dynamics, uh, etc. Mm-hmm. Then uh, I had a, a sort of a, a, a running battle with Hobson uh, uh, over you know, mm-hmm. our respective interpretations. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a very good neuroimager 
uh, 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 he, did, did, he did fantastic pet imaging mm. of the dreaming brain. Uh, his name was Alan Brown. Mm. And, and, and he politely pointed out to me in, in, in print, in fact, uh, in, in, uh, there was a, um, uh, in a journal, there was a kind of a, uh, I don't know if I was commenting on a paper of Hobson's or Hobson was commenting on a paper of mine, but Alan Brown was one of the commentators. And he said, you know, it's, it's, it's really quite odd what Solms is doing. Uh, he's saying, uh, you know, that uh, dreams are driven by the mesocortical, mesolimbic dopamine system, and therefore he's locating it in the forebrain. But look where the source cells of that system are. The source cells are in the brainstem. Yeah. Uh, that system arises from the reticular activating system, no less than Hobson's cholinergic one. Mm -hmm. um, the ventral tegmental area of the brainstem is where that system arises. Yeah. And so that, that sort of, that was a big uh, wake-up call for me, uh, where I had to sort of eat humble pie and realize, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we are still in the brainstem. Yeah. Um, the, the, but, 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 uh, in an emotionally interesting part of the brainstem. You know, the, the, what that system does, even though it's a brainstem system, is in every respect mental. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's called the brain reward system, you know. In the, in the, um, in the midbrain, uh, correct? Right? Because yes, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's in the, it's, it's, it's sort of transition between midbrain and diencephalin, where the ventral tegmental area is. Mm -hmm. But it's brainstem. I mean, there's no right. other mm -hmm. word for it. And... Um, so that led me to become interested in these brainstem arousal mechanisms, uh, it, which is where Hobson had led us in the first place, but, but to become interested in them in relation to affect, in relation to emotional feelings and motivations and so on. And that's what led me to Panksepp, because Panksepp was the expert on brainstem mechanisms of emotion. So I met him in... Well, I first corresponded with him in, in uh, 1998, which is when his great um, magnum opus, the, the, his Affective book with Oxford University Press. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was published in 98. Um, I was just blown away by that book. Uh, I then uh, invited him to participate in a conference that I was organizing in the following year. Um, and um, it, and that changed my scientific life. I mean, he's he's had more influence on me than than... than than anyone else, um, and and made me aware that uh, that that feelings uh, are not cortical business. That, that raw feeling arises from brainstem mechanisms, and and ultimately, you know, that raw feeling because because all cortical consciousness is contingent upon, dependent upon, aroused by those brainstem mechanisms. It made me realize that consciousness itself. Uh, in its in its elemental form was actually affective, um, and so and that was all of everything I've just said now is no great insight of mine. It was Panksepp's Panksepp's insight um, that that uh, that I then um, um, adopted and 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 then took took further in my own ways. Yeah, no, that's no, that's great. I mean, it's it's so fascinating how I, I see this all the time where people will say, "Well, I started out here." And then I, you know, I, I kind of, you know, ended up over here. And then, you know, now 40 years later, I'm still, you know, doing this where I ended up by accident. You know, that happens literally all the time. Um, yes. Um, okay. So let's, let's do just a, just for, for, I think for listeners, a uh, little bit of uh, overview of the, you know, brain anatomy, particularly subcortical and then uh, in the brainstem. And then, and then we can get into Panksepp's kind of feelings piece, and then we can talk about that, and then we'll get to consciousness. So we'll take kind of the the long route, but it will make sense for for everyone that uh, doesn't <laughs> hasn't done neuropsych uh, courses or or any uh, physiology. Okay, so um, so all of the stuff that you've been talking about has been the way I, I typically explain it. And you can you can correct me here. But, you know, you have the brain, right? And you have, you know, cortical, subcortical, you have you know, cerebellum at the, at the base, and then you have the brainstem. The brainstem is composed of the um, hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain. So it's kind of divided into three layers or three sections. And the forebrain kind of starts to, you know, peek into the, the rest of the brain and the cortex and, it, and, and definitely interacts that way. And so much of your work that you're doing is all of this or m much of this stuff is happening within the the brainstem is happening uh in, in that way and so maybe just kind of explain to us you know 
generally how, how these things you've mentioned the reticular activating system and all this, how, how are these things just normally, how are they working? And then how do we start to see where, you know, based on Pengsep's work and, and others, you know, where feelings are starting to originate from, from these places. I think the easiest way to convey it uh, to, to non-specialists um, is, is in fact, although you said we'll end with consciousness, I think that starting with consciousness makes it easier because okay. everyone knows what consciousness is because, you know, we, 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 we're experiencing it right now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at your conscious experience right now, what does it consist in? It consists in, well, above all, things that you can see, mm -hmm. you know, visual qualities, uh, sights, uh, you know, colors, and, 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 and movements, uh, contrasts, etc., cetera, um, and, uh, and other perceptual qualities. So it's what you see, what you hear, uh, what you feel in, uh, on the surface of your body, um, uh, which um, sort of colloquially we call touch, um, and what you smell and what you taste. Those are the raw ingredients of your consciousness. Um, and so where does consciousness come, come from? It comes from your, your senses. Uh, it flows in with sensory information. And uh, the early anatomists followed uh, the, the pathways and found that those pathways from your sense organs terminate in your cortex. Mm -hmm. The cortex is the big sort of curly curly whirly right. bit that right. fills out the cranium. Right. Um, and there are different parts of the cortex which generate visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, mm -hmm. somatosensory consciousness, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so we, our common sense tells us that consciousness flows in with perception. Um, and the anatomy shows us that consciousness uh, is, uh, is activated by perception in the cortex. Um, then came a big surprise. The brain stem which is, you know, if you think of a flower, the cortex is sort of the petals mm -hmm. uh, and the stamen, uh, the, 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 the bottom stem part, you know, is the brain stem. Yep. Um, that, that was always seen as completely non-mental. That's, that's uh, where the reflexes are, the non-voluntary part. The lizard brain, the unconscious right? stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so the big surprise came in 1949 when two physiologists, Magoon and Maruzzi, discovered that that if you make a small bit of damage in that brain stem the lights go out yeah uh, the, the lights go out in the cortex so uh, and if you disconnect the cortex from the brain stem just a small little area you know you just sever the connection mm -hmm. uh, the, the the cortex is no longer conscious mm -hmm. so that's that showed us uh, this is not controversial what I'm saying now you know yeah. that showed us yeah. that the power supply of consciousness it uh, comes from deep with, deeply inside the brain itself. It doesn't flow in from outside. It comes from the innermost core of a very ancient and primitive part of the brain that we previously thought had no mental functions at all. So that's the basic thing that listeners need to get is that we used to think consciousness flows in from outside with, uh, with cortical information. Uh, and we then discovered that actually it, the cortical processing of information only becomes conscious if it's activated from below, uh, from this brainstem area called the reticular activating system. So that, that was known, as I said, since 1949. What, what became apparent to us in the 1990s and Panksepp led the way, mm -hmm. was the insight that this power supply of consciousness from the brain stem uh, is not just a quantity. It's not just a level of consciousness. It's not just wakefulness. Uh, it has a quality and a content of its own. And that quality and content is affect, is feeling. That, that when I said earlier, look at what your consciousness consists in, and I mentioned the five perceptual modalities, you know, I'm sure most listeners agreed. Yep, that's what I'm experiencing yeah. now. But what we leave out is that in addition to those five things, they're feelings. Yeah. And those feelings come from inside of us. They're about the subject. They're not about object. We, we, we feel things about um, objects in the outside world, but the feeling is ours. It's what we attribute to the outside world. It doesn't flow in from outside. It arises, it bubbles up from within us. So this power supply of consciousness turns out to be raw feeling. Feeling is what activates the cortex into consciousness. And, and in the, simultaneously with that discovery in, uh, in the 1990s, uh, extending into this century, um, was the dawning awareness that actually the cortex uh, is not intrinsically conscious, 
not only because it depends upon brainstem arousal to become conscious, but also that when it is not so aroused, it nevertheless is able to process information pretty, pretty darn well. In other words, that most of what the cortex does, it can do it unconsciously. We can perceive unconsciously, we can learn unconsciously, we can read and understand what we're reading unconsciously, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the whole, the, the whole picture starts to change, uh, that uh, cortex is not intrinsically conscious, uh, cognition is not is not the, the 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 starting point. Perception and cognition is not the starting point of consciousness. It actually starts right down below in the brainstem, and it is affective, a feeling, a, a emotion, and so you know that radically changes our whole conception uh, of of how the brain works, and and it's very counterintuitive. Now you ask about where Panksepp fits into that. Panksepp takes us beyond the, my merely saying that the brain stem is where feeling comes from. He passed the different circuits uh, in order to identify what the, 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 the natural kinds of affect are uh, in, the, in the mammal brain and, and in the human brain. So that's very powerful knowledge to know what the basic categories of feeling are, uh, which, is, uh, which is to say, you know, what are the basic sources of everything that drives our conscious mental life. That, that's what he did and identified the different circuits and the different chemistries of those circuits. And that's extremely, extremely important knowledge. Now, those circuits, just to complete my story, we spoke about the brain stem, which is at the bottom, uh, and the cortex, which is at the top. Um, and then the thing that connects the two uh, is what we call the limbic brain. It's a sort yeah. of in-between brain. And these circuits are, are, are what we loosely term the limbic system. They, 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 um, they are the interconnect, interconnecting links between the basic arousal systems of the brainstem and the highly elaborated cognitive consciousness of the cortex. Yeah. Yeah. So, so primary to that, I think what most people may know is you know, the amygdala, right? Which is, you know, again, is a main player in subcortical uh, levels of the, of the brain. The three, the, the excuse me, the three, the the. Let me see if I have this right. Uh, I wrote them down. The seven that Panksepp had uh, uh, listed was lust, seeking, rage, fear, uh, panic slash grief, play, and care. Care. Yeah. No, there. Thank, thank mm. you. Um, you know, and you know, the, basically, he's saying these seven. Uh, feeling states are are what dri what drives consciousness right this is what's how we know that you know consciousness is not just sensory input right it is it is arising from the power source to say from these uh oh this categorization of affective states to say well this is what it's like to be you right like everyone has these uh, parts but then there's the particular right so i'm kind of jumping here to the hard problem right of consciousness which is what is it like to be you right so we everything you just said is you know i would agree with but there is still a difference right about what it's like to be you and what it's like to be me and so how do we understand that in terms of consciousness okay first i must just supplement what you said Xavier. the Please. the those seven emotional affects um, are indeed the seven natural kinds of emotion, but there are other affects which are not emotional. Uh, mm -hmm. They are bodily affects. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, by an affect, uh, we mean something that's valence, that has a goodness and a badness to it. Yep. Um, so there are feelings, affective feelings like hunger, thirst, sleepiness, um, you know, the, 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 the need to urinate. Um, right. Right. All of these are also affects. There's a goodness and badness to them too. So I just don't want listeners to, um, to, to uh, I want listeners to, 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 to not think that consciousness is made up only of emotional feelings. There are yes. also these bodily feelings. Yes. Emotions are a slightly higher level um, of things, but um, they are very important um, for, for this reason, which leads into the answer to your question. Um, we are born with these natural drives, you know, the drive to eat, the drive to drink, the drive to sleep, and including the emotional ones. In other words, the drive to escape danger, the drive to get rid of frustrating impediments, uh, the drive to copulate, you know, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, the, 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 these are, uh, but with each of them, these are demands on the mind to perform work. There's, there's, there's a pressure, you know, there's a need. 
Uh, and then we have instincts, uh, which are built inbuilt um, solutions to how to meet those needs. So if we have a need to escape danger, we have an inbuilt behavior, which is freezing or fleeing. Right. This is an instinctual behavior. Um, uh, if we have a need to get rid of frustrating impediments, uh, we have built into our brains affective attack. You know, you, 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 th this is a this is an innate uh, response to that need. Uh, if you're separated from your caregiver, we have a need to be looked after, our little us little mammals, mm -hmm. um, and then if you become separated from, you have a, an instinct which is cry and search for her. You know, right. this is this is what we do. Now, the, the point I'm leading up to is that's innate, that's um, generic. Uh, we are all born with those responses, mm -hmm. but they're not enough. Um, you know, just think about um, you know every everybody who frustrates you, you can't hit them. What if it's your father? You right. know, what if they're bigger than you? <laughs> you know, uh, 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 if if every time you're scared, uh, all you can do is run away. You know, you've got an anxiety disorder. You know, you have to you have to <laughs> right. have a more nuanced response to anxiety than just flight, right. uh, etc. So this is where learning from experience uh, kicks yes. in. So we we have these instinctual responses to our biological needs, but then we have to supplement those instinctual responses through learning uh, by, uh, by experience. Mm -hmm. So, and this is in fact what the function of the feeling is. Feeling tells you how well you're doing. Uh, if we only had reflexes and instincts, we wouldn't need feelings. We would just have automatic response patterns. Uh, and indeed, some animals, simple animals, that is all they have, and their behavior is entirely predictable. But they can only survive in predictable situations for that very reason. Uh, what, what feeling does is it enables you to feel your way through the problem. So, you know, you do one thing and it, it makes things worse or better. Uh, in relation to the particular need in question. And that's how you learn, you know, uh, in addition to what your instincts uh, uh, do, you, you can you can supplement them with these much more nuanced, context-dependent, uh, flexible um, uh, uh, alternatives that you've learned, in this situation, I do that. In that situation, I do the other thing. With this guy, I, I respond like this. With that guy, I respond right. like that. Right. And so this is how our individualized personalities um, are, are constructed. Starting with basic natural kinds of response, uh, we learn from experience uh, through voluntary, not reflex, not automatized uh, behaviors. Through through voluntary, which is voluntary behavior, just means making choices, and yeah. choices are rooted in these values uh, of it's, uh, is it feeling better or is it feeling worse, which ultimately predicts your survival or your demise. That's how that's how we personalize and individualize our repertoire of responses. Please note, though, how it's all rooted in feeling. You know that mm -hmm. the subject of the mm -hmm. mind is literally constituted by feeling. Uh, if I can just make the point here, uh, it's as if it's as if our our minds work like this. It's sort of I feel like this. That's that's the sort of grounding affect of makes you exist. You know, mm -hmm. I feel this, mm -hmm. and then it is I feel like this about that, mm -hmm. and the feelings are extended onto your perceptions and your cognitions and your representation of the outside world, which is where you have to meet your needs. Mm. So you have, so you bestow meaning upon the world uh, by virtue of the fact that you have exper affective experiences in relation to that world, which you're compelled to engage with because that's where your needs are going to be met. Whatever it is that you need, it's out there. And so you have mm. to, so, so external experience contextualizes your feelings. Uh, and and um, and and so uh, it's no accident that our minds end up being directed toward external events, uh, and and we end up losing sight of the fact that the only reason we're interested in external events in the first place is because uh, of the connection with our needs and therefore our feelings. Yeah, no, I mean this is. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to you say all this, and it's like you know, I'm kind of I feel that kind of rush, right? All this stuff is terribly fascinating. So. You're you're saying that because I, I already feel my my mind going to like you know not the application but like the impacts that this has for various things which I'll get to a little bit um, but so just to 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 kind of recap because you you'll see since we're on this you know a lot of people will have some confusion on this um, is for psychologists they will you know say things like um, 
you know, there's difference between, like you mentioned it, affect, feeling, valence, um, uh, emotions, right? And so you've kind of depicted the kind of, I don't want to say hierarchy, but, you know, there's drives, there's instincts, feelings are at the top, they're kind of connected and motivating, right? I, I always see feelings as kind of like the signal, right? You know, tell you to investigate something, or, you know, it, it doesn't, I would say feelings are somewhat neutral of sorts, right? They're, they're a mechanism wherein to, to point you towards something, right? And then you can have more um, ideas about things. But just kind of detail that the sort of a little bit, but just in a, a, a recap kind of way, the affect emotions feelings piece of it you've already talked about the feelings and then the emotions and affect how do you understand those differences uh, well uh, i think what what needs to be said uh, here is that there is no general consensus about how we should use these words so it, it's it's not surprising that people get confused because different yeah. scientists mean different things by <laughs> yes. the very same words yes. and uh, you know unless we have some uh, official body that sits us all down and forces <laughs> us to agree on this nomenclature. Uh, and uh, uh, unless that happens, uh, all that we can do is each one of us has to be clear at least yes. about what we mean by those terms. So um, I, uh, the terms that I've already used, let, let me start at the bottom. Uh, the, the, first, you have needs. Yeah. Uh, so these are biological need. The body needs certain things, um, and and the so does the mind need certain things. So I've, I've referred to, for example, we need nutrients. That's that's the need that gives rise ultimately to hunger. We also need to escape dangers. Uh, so that's that gives rise ultimately to fear. So let's start with need. That's so that's what I mean by need is. If I may just quickly elaborate here, homeostasis is a concept I need to introduce here. Yeah, uh, homeostasis refers to the fact that uh, we living creatures need to remain within certain viable bounds. So, yeah. for example, core body temperature, you can't just be in any old temperature. Right. You know, I, I don't think in Fahrenheit, so forgive me, in, in no, Celsius, okay. Go ahead. you have to be between 36 and a half and 37 and a half degrees Celsius. That's where you've got to be. Right. Um, so, when I speak of need, I mean, deviations from our homeostatic settling points, sugar level, water level, uh, energies, supply, etc. A deviation from that is a need. Um, the, the, the next level up uh, is to, is when, because we have so many needs, uh, they're all happening, they're all being regulated simultaneously, autonomically, in other words, mm -hmm. unconsciously, automatically. Right. Um, only some of those needs uh, rise to the level of making a demand upon the mind. In other words, you know, the one that you become conscious of. Mm -hmm. Then we speak of a drive. So a nutritional need is dealt with. Uh, you're burning up the uh, glucose in your adipose tissues all the time. You don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you become hungry, you feel it. So that's a drive. Uh, a drive uh, is because you feel it, um, I, 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 I use the word drive uh, rather than need, uh, and that's that's just my way of using it. You know, it used to say that that's the right way, but at least at least I think it's, there's a difference between a need and a drive, and so we need to use different words to convey those two things. A drive is is affective. Um, mm -hmm. By affective, I mean it's valence. Mm -hmm. Valence means there's a goodness and a badness, and you feel it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that's what that's what raises the, the 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 concept of need to the level of a concept of drive. Drives are intrinsically felt and intrinsically affective things, uh, and I've defined what I mean by affect. Affect has has it it is subjectively felt. Uh, it's valenced. In other words, there's a goodness and a badness that does not apply to perception. So that's, mm -hmm. that's how affect is different from perception. Yeah. Uh, and it has a particular quality so that hunger feels different from thirst, feels different from sleepiness and so on. Those are what affects are. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Then we divide bodily affects and emotional affects. Mm -hmm. um, and so their word emotion, for me, uh, is, uh, hunger is not an emotion, thirst is not an emotion, but fear is and rage is, et cetera. And, and there's no sharp dividing line between bodily affects and and mental emotions um but the but roughly speaking uh, the, the 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 difference is that emotions have to do with other mental agents usually other people so you know you're hungry uh, there's an apple you, you take it 
You know, right. you, you're thirsty, there's some water, you drink it. It's just sitting there waiting for you. Right. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't have a mind of its own. But if you're <laughs> scared of somebody who's attacking you, you've got to try and outwit them. You know, mm -hmm. or you're trying to find your mother who seems to have abandoned you. You know, she's, where is she? Doesn't she know I need you? you know? yeah. And I cry out, doesn't mean she's going to come. She might have other needs of her own and so on. So emotions have to do with other mental agents. And I say agents because you can also have emotional relationship with your dog or your cat. Sure. It's not only people. Right. But the crucial thing is that it's much more, that, that other mental agents are much less predictable than mm. apples and water are. It's a more, it sounds so, like more of an active, passive kind of quality to it of sorts. Yes, yes, yes. And so learning how to meet emotional needs is a hell of a lot harder than learning how to meet bodily needs. <laughs> yes, this, it is. <laughs> and this is why our patients uh, who, who come to psychotherapy, uh, they don't come saying, you know, I, I don't know how to drink or I don't know how to eat. Uh, for the most part, they say, you know, I don't know how to deal with my emotions. Can right. you help me? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. So, so let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna tee you up here a little bit. So, can we say that? And I think you say this in the book, but feelings are conscious, right? Yes. Um, and 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 these drives and the instincts are unconscious. Um, so, they're, so so we're not um, readily or immediately, you know, thinking about it. Right? I'm not gonna think. Well, I need to have this hunger, right? You know, I, I'm mm. gonna, I'm gonna, it's gonna rise to consciousness from the unconscious, mm. and then say, okay, I need to eat. I'm hungry, um, mm. and so in this way, there is this kind of, you know, at least for me, right, and and for you as well. But how how could this not map on to Freud's topographical map of conscious and unconscious, right? You know, if you're having these ideas. Or, or if, excuse me, if he's having these ideas of the whole thing with Freud, right? You, you know, you can you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but you know, he gets a lot of he gets a lot of shit placed at him for all these things, right? You know, and, <laughs> but it's one of those things where you know he really was philosophically doing Plato's work, you know, thousands of years later, right? He's trying to make this kind of system of how we understand, you know, humans, right? How, how we understand, you know, people. And this, you know, the conscious unconscious aspect, but for him, it was tension reduction. You have these drives and you're trying to reduce, and it's not just drives, but, you know, it starts there at, at, at an elementary level where it's, how do we understand how we're able to reduce the tension that we have? And, and so based on what you've mapped out thus far, it would seem, again, I don't want to be too uh, reductionistic, but a lot of the stuff in the mid or the, um, the brainstem and and how we're understanding where consciousness arises through um, these affective experiences. How do we then understand? Well, then you have the cortical level, right? Which everyone has been so uh, uh, interested in for so many years about you know prefrontal cortex and executive functioning and orbital frontal and all these different areas of the brain. Um, but it sounds like the, the 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 mapping has already been there, right? In terms of Conscious, unconscious, you know, uh, subcort, or you could say the brainstem going into forebrain and then the cortical level. Do you kind of start to kind of merge those two worlds together, or how, how do you kind of see that? Well, what you're saying um, is, uh, in a in a in a in a in a manner of speaking, Freud already had uh, within his grasp the basic building blocks uh, of of how the mind works, um, and I agree with that. And, and why, we, why, why one uh, wants to say that about Freud is because what differentiated him from his peers, um, from his contemporaries, was he was saying, basically, not to put too fine a point on it, you know, we are human beings, but we're a species of animal. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, human beings are a species of animal. And uh, so, you know, our brains are embodied. Uh, and whatever the brain does, including its mental functions, must somehow be serving the needs of the body. In other words, the needs of the organisms that organisms need to survive and reproduce. And uh, so that shocked his Victorian contemporaries, you know, to say <laughs> that we are just, you know, uh, animals. Uh, but, but, but that is what he said. And so that's what gave rise to this, what you've just pointed out. That, that Freud already was saying, well, there are these unconscious bodily functions uh, which 
which which then uh, you know make uh, demands upon the mind, uh, which gives rise to feelings and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's true. This is why uh, when I uh, started, uh, we, we were speaking earlier in this conversation about the resistance of my colleagues yeah, to me yeah. bringing psychoanalysis uh, into neuroscience. You know, I, I just think that it's scientifically honest to do so, to say, look, I'm not the first one to think of this. Mm -hmm. Freud already had these basic concepts. Right. And, you know, we've got to give credit where credit's due. I, I, I think Freud, Freud is to neuroscience uh, or to certainly to neuropsychology, to the to the science of the mind, uh, he is uh, he is to that science what Darwin was to evolutionary biology and and, mm. and Newton was to classical physics and so on. Mm. You know that the, the great pioneers who see the thing in rough outline and yeah. you know that doesn't mean that they got everything right and they sure. knew everything in advance right. and that they were prophets or anything. You know it's just that. <laughs> Right. They they saw they were the first ones to see that some sort of like pretty obvious truth, and yeah. and and once they've pointed it out to us, well, we can't help but notice it. So yes, if everything you're saying is correct. That this this all builds, uh, and and that's why I um you know why I'm 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 perfectly willing to. Uh, I even use the word neuropsychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I say what I'm doing, you know, because neuropsychology, the neuropsychology that I learned. You might as well have called it neurobehaviorism because yeah, there was no right, mind there. Right, right. So, so, so I sort of mischievously said, "Well, let me call mine neuropsychoanalysis, <laughs> so that we know what we're talking about." Is the same thing that Freud was talking about, <laughs> right? You know. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. And so, I, I was we were, as we were going along, I wanted to ask this: Where, where was it that you know, obviously Panks up? You know, his his. Uh, you know, I would say his legend looms large, right? You know, he was so huge and figuring this out and all the stuff he did with rats and figuring all this thing, that's incredible. But, you know, how did you, you know, where did you take some of those ideas or, or you know, obviously being influenced in where it's your ideas, where it's like, okay, this is now where I do, I mean, there's the an, an, um, analysis piece and I don't know what he felt about psychoanalysis, but, you know, where did you take it on, on kind of your own and say, okay, this is, you know, I've, all of this I'm very sympathetic to or agree with, but here's my, you know, uh, angle on it, or here's my approach to it that maybe is not necessarily different, but just a, you know, a different branch on the tree of sorts. Yeah. Well, I think I can, I think I can, uh, I can use two headings for the ways in which I extended Yark Panksepp's work. Um, the first was, what we've just been talking about, psychoanalysis. Another way of another way of putting it is um, the human mind as opposed to the animal mind. Hmm. The great advantage of human minds is that they can speak, um, yes. so you can you can interrogate the subjective experience of a human being in a way that you can't with any other animal. Right. So Yark saw. Uh, and so I'm a neuropsychologist, uh, uh, both a researcher and a clinician working with human beings. Uh, Yark was a, a, a neuroscientist working with, you mentioned uh, rodents, that was the main species. He's, he also worked with dogs and with birds, and but mm -hmm. most, mostly rodents. But dogs, birds, rodents, uh, uh, all of them uh, can't speak. So Yark was interested in feelings, uh, in what he was learning about the basic emotional circuitry of the mammal brain. Um, mm -hmm. And what he saw in my work was the possibility of us studying those very same systems in the human brain um, and using psychoanalytic methods. In other words, taking subjective experience and first-person reports seriously. Uh, because, you know, uh, things get very complicated in the human uh, oh, yeah. brain oh, too. Yes. So. <laughs> So that the, the, he, when you say you don't know what Yark thought about that, he welcomed it. Uh, he and I were the co-chairs of the Neuro, International Neuropsychoanalysis Society till his death. Mm. So he, he saw he saw neuropsychoanalysis as an opportunity to extend his affect of neuroscience into into the human species and to take advantage of this 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 this. Uh, unique property of the human uh, uh, brain that, that it can report on its own subjective states. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the second thing that I added to what Yark uh, uh, did um, 
let me go back to that word homeostasis. I said yeah. that the, there's a, a simple mechanism. It actually is the fundamental mechanism that differentiates living from non-living things. Uh, homeostasis, the, only living things have needs. We need to stay within these viable bounds. And uh, so we have to perform work to do that. Mm -hmm. um, now, homeost as I've just described it, you know, we have, a, we have a settling point where we need to be. We have a deviation from that. That's an error signal, you know, and then we have to do something to, right. to, to, to uh, uh, get rid of the error signal. Uh, it, I hope you will agree with me. What I've just said is not complicated. You know, uh, th this, no, is a, this is a very simple mechanism. Very straightforward. <laughs> yeah. So that led me, I, I, I read a paper by a, a computational neuroscientist known as Carl Friston. No, well, not known as, his name is Carl Friston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and this paper, uh, which he published in 2013, was entitled Life as We Know It. Mm -hmm. And what he did in that paper was to reduce to mathematical equations uh, the laws governing homeostasis. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the laws governing the behavior of these brainstem nuclei that keep us alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not surprising he was able to reduce those laws uh, to, uh, to equations because they're simple, you know, they're predictable. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's not, if you'll excuse the pun, it's not rocket science. It's not <laughs> um, right. But what, what shocked me when I read this paper of Friston's was, well, uh, if feeling is an extended form of homeostasis and feeling is the basic a type of consciousness, uh, and Friston has reduced homeostasis to a set of equations, can't we extend those equations to reduce feeling to causal laws? Okay, can we, do we have within our grasp the, the possibility of a causal, quantifiable, mechanistic account of how raw feelings arise? And so I started a collaboration with Carl Friston uh, in the wake of that. Now, Yark, uh, this was, we're talking about the last years of Yark's life. Yark was very suspicious about this. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he was a biologist of the mind and he, he, you know, he wasn't so sure that we can, that, that we should be going, you know, down a mathematical, a, a, a physics, a, a, a information a science a, a, a route. So, uh, but he was ill in, in the last uh, years and, you know, we, we never were able to, I never was able to persuade him, but nor did I really have opportunity to comprehensively do so. Um, so in my mind, what Friston taught me and the way in which Friston and I have extended uh, Yark's framework, because remember, we're just starting with homeostasis and a basic idea right. about affect and Yark certainly agreed that that's how affects work. And we've extended it into a, 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 a computational uh, modeling type of uh, uh, way of thinking. And uh, uh, th that's the second thing I believe that I've, mm. that I've added to what, what Yark taught me. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's great. I think that um, I, just because we're, we're here on this, I, I wanted to say that when, when you were talking earlier about the different aspects of the brain and how, how we understand where you know not everything is just cortical things are are also in the the brainstem you know what what does if if consciousness arises again this is a, a little bit of a detour but i wanted to 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 flag it uh what what does that say about other animals um you know our our you know we, we can get continue on the more of the consciousness uh, track for a minute but um you know, I mean, the, 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 the big thing that you know, some people suggest is that, you know, maybe the, the octopus or different cephalopods have some form of consciousness. They have, you know, or when you look all the way down to certain, certain uh, organisms, right, you know, other mammals, uh, crustaceans, you know, whatever. How do they, there's the, 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 some of the similar parts, you know, many of the, the many animals on the on the planet have some, I kind of colloquially said, you know, that, that old phrase, a lizard brain and all that stuff. If some of these things are rising in the very fundamental aspects of the brain and how it works, at least the mammalian brain, is it, is it, you know, possible that, you know, humans aren't the only one that have uh, consciousness. And again, that, you know, maybe it's a little bit of speculation, but what are just kind of your brief thoughts on that, I guess? Let me uh, answer this question in two directions. 
please. Um, starting from the bottom up and then from the top please. down. Yeah, please. Um, so uh, building on what I've just said about homeostasis mm -hmm. uh, uh, and how it differentiates living from non-living things, mm -hmm. uh, that means, uh, and doesn't just imply logically, it actually is the case that even the simplest living organism, a single cell, uh, is governed by homeostasis. Right. Um, so from from unicellular organisms up to multicellular organisms, you know, and then eventually we get to animals with nervous systems. Right. Um, what, what the nervous system and the brain in particular adds to homeostasis is what one might call meta-homeostasis. In other words, it has homeostats that regulate the homeostats. <laughs> uh -huh. So, you know, uh, it's a kind of overarching control center. Mm -hmm. um, and... and uh, uh, it, it, and then we go all the way up to everything I've been talking to you about, how yep. the human brain works. Right. Now, now I'll go from the top down. We know we human beings, because we are human beings, uh, uh, we, we each of us know from our own uh, personal experience that we're conscious. Um, and we can speak to each other. And so we can persuade each other that, you know, we are not the only one. Uh, you know, Xavier is conscious too. <laughs> right, um, right, right. And uh, and then we can start doing science, you know, where, where we start, we, we examine, uh, as I have uh, for all, all my life, examined the effects upon consciousness of damage to different parts of the human brain. So I talk to my patients about how their experience is altered uh, by uh, damage to different parts of their brain. And I observe uh, in my patients the way in which they're consciousness is altered. In other words, mm -hmm. for example, patients with a brainstem lesion who fall into a coma, they can't tell me I'm in a coma, but my <laughs> God, you can see they're in a coma. You know, they're doing nothing. Um, right. And when they come out of the coma, they report to you, I was not there, nothing happened. <laughs> right, right. And so on. So, so uh, uh, what I'm saying in a nutshell is that it, it's easy to determine in the human brain what parts are doing what in relation to consciousness. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and I've spoken about lesions. It's not the only method. We stimulate those structures with deep brain electrodes. We generate the, those functions. Uh, we can manipulate the chemistries of those systems. And we, in, in that way, we manipulate their consciousness. Uh, we can do a functional brain imaging of them in different mental conscious states. And you can see which parts of the brain light up. So all of these different methods have given us a, a, a solid understanding of where the consciousness arises from in the human brain. And it arises from the term we've used already, the reticular activating system, and another structure right behind it uh, called the periaqueductal gray, which I'll call PAG for short, periaqueductal gray. Now, those structures are what gives rise to consciousness. And remember, the raw form of consciousness is feeling. So yeah. we know in humans, feelings arise from there, uh, in the, the, the fundamental form. Therefore, we can look to see which other creatures have those same structures. Mm. Uh, which other animals have a reticular activating system and a periaqueductal gray? Because we know in our own cases what they do. They generate conscious feelings. Then we can make predictions. We can say, well, if you stimulate this part of the PAG in a human being, they experience excruciating pain. If you stimulate that part in the human being, they have an orgasm. So let's see what happens uh, with the with with, uh, with these other creatures. I predict if I stimulate here, the animal will be very unhappy and will want to get the hell away from the stimulus. And conversely, if I stimulate there, you know, it will fall in love with me and and, and the stimulus and want to hang about uh, it uh, uh, forever. So those predictions are reliably confirmed in other animals, and I'll tell you which animals I'm talking about in a moment. So we have really pretty good scientific basis for inferring, because you can only infer it. You can only yeah. infer consciousness. Uh, even in you, I can only infer you consciousness. Right, right, I can't right, see it. Right. Um, but but uh, you know, we have there's, uh, using standard scientific methods, falsifiable predictions arising from our hypotheses, grounded in you know converging lines of evidence. Uh, certainly all primates are conscious like you and I are. All mammals are conscious like you and I are. They have the same basic emotions. The, the seven emotions we spoke of earlier, mm -hmm. all mammals have them. Mm -hmm. um, and every prediction arising from that hypothesis is confirmed. Then you get down to vertebrates, all vertebrates. Uh, in other words, all creatures with, uh, with a spinal cord. 
Mm -hmm. um, they have a reticular activating system and a periaqueductal gray, and it certainly seems to do the same thing in all vertebrates. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, when we're speaking about vertebrates, we're going down to the level of fishes. Yeah. You know, and, and this may shock uh, many listeners, and they might lose confidence in what I'm saying to them uh, when I start saying <laughs> it's not only monkeys and baboons and chimpanzees, uh, it's also dogs and cats and horses and moo cows, uh, and it's also um, snakes and lizards uh, and fishes and tortoises. Uh, but the evidence is very strong because the, I'll, I'll just give you an example, a zebra fish. Uh -huh. uh, you put them in a tank uh, and uh, you put the food on the left side of the tank. They all congregate on the left side of the tank because that's where the food is because zebra fish need food. Mm -hmm. Now on the right side of the tank, you put cocaine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, in a separate experiment, morphine, and in another experiment, nicotine, and in another one, um, amphetamine. What you find is that the fish now hover, hover around the right-hand side of the tank and only dart to the left-hand side to feed when they, when they have to. Otherwise, they want to be where the cocaine is, etc. <laughs> now, what does that tell us? It tells us that they're motivated by feelings. Mm -hmm. Because cocaine and amphetamine, and they, they don't do anything good. They don't give you, they have no nutritional value. The only thing that's appealing about them is the feeling state that they generate. So this is what I mean by evidence. You know, we, we, we make a prediction. We say, well, if the, if the fish have feelings, they should like cocaine. Hey, presto, they do. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have good empirical grounds for believing that all vertebrates are conscious. In other words, all vertebrates have differentiated feelings, goodness and badness in, in relation to various uh, biological needs. What do we know beyond vertebrates? Uh, there we're on less firm ground uh, because we don't have these anatomical homologs. Mm. Uh, by homolog, I mean, you know, the same structure in the same place doing the same thing. Right. So you spoke of um, cephalopods, you spoke of uh, octopi, mm. um, and uh, in fact, um, there, there are many people who believe that insects are conscious. There are many people who believe that crustacea, in other words, mm -hmm. lobsters, uh, mm -hmm. are conscious. Uh, but I just feel we, we, they might be right. Mm -hmm. I just feel we're on, less, we're on less firm ground because we can no longer extrapolate from the human where we know we are conscious. Mm -hmm. um, and we know which brain mechanisms generate that consciousness. So we're on solid ground when we find the same mechanisms seem to do the same things in other creatures. When we go to creatures who have different mechanisms, um, it becomes less solid. So what do we do? Mm. Well, then we have to have recourse to functional definitions of consciousness rather than anatomical and physiological mm. ones. Mm -hmm. So for example, I, I, I've just briefly alluded in our discussion to the centrality of choice. Mm. Voluntary behavior is rooted in choice. Uh, it enables the animal to not be bound only by instincts and reflexes. In other words, it, it doesn't have a predetermined algorithm uh, that always does the same thing in the same situation. A choice, uh, which, is, which is rooted in feeling, uh, the value system of goodness and badness, um, enables you to decide, um, you sort of like, what's that phrase, suck it and see, you know? Mm -hmm. you, sort of, you sort of try it out and see mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so we believe that that's what feeling is for. That's what it enables the animal to do. It enables the animal to transcend uh, 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 hardwired uh, predictions, hardwired algorithms, and 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 um, and have show voluntary behavior. Uh, in other words, a uh, behavior where it makes its own choices here and now. So that's a functional account of what consciousness is. And rather than saying which brain structures do that, we say, well, I don't know in the octopus which brain structures do that, but if it can make choices. Uh, in a novel environment, it can it can uh, uh, feel its way through a problem, uh, if I can put it tendentiously. You know, then I, I'm I'm willing to say, well, the evidence suggests that, uh, and, and certainly in the case of an octopus, it passes that test. Mm. I mean, octopi think their way through novel problems in very impressively. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just end by saying um, the place preference test that I just mentioned in relation to zebra fishes is passed by crusta some crustacea. Lobsters, for example, are also keen on cocaine. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, we, we use these kinds, but you, you're just not so sure. Uh, 
I, I want to make sure that everybody understands what I'm saying. There is every reason to believe that all vertebrates are conscious. Mm -hmm. That means that they have feelings. Um, and there's every reason to believe that mammals have the same basic feelings that we have. Uh, beyond the vertebrates, there's plenty of examples where there may well be consciousness. There's good reason to believe there may be, but we're just less certain about it. Yeah, no, that's that's deeply fascinating because you know people, myself included, have this you know wild obsession with with uh, octopi. They're fascinating creatures, and you know there's a paper that's just put out with you know they passed the marshmallow test, right? Can they have some type of uh, impulse control of sorts, right? Can they sustain that? You know, it's terribly fascinating because uh, we've only observed that or seen that with a handful of animals, including humans. Um, so I think there is some some functional aspects there that you know we keep learning a few things about about uh, that wonderful creature, but I, I don't want I just want to mention it I don't want to uh, to to go down it because it's definitely a, a long t long path that will steer us away from from uh, a few of the other things to to chat about but you know you're saying this choice aspect and there are many people that will say well we don't have free will now. We have the illusion of it, of sorts, right? We have, we have the, the um, you kind of can talk about it in terms of degrees of freedom, right? But, but at an at a elementary foundational level, you don't have the choice to do that, right? I don't know the next sentence I'm going to say, you know, you can look at, you know, different forms of luck, of sorts of, you know, you don't determine your biology, right? You're, you don't know where you're born, um, even you know, when you make a choice to do something or to not do something, there are all these other things that are influencing it. And you still don't say, well, I will do this. That is coming from somewhere. And uh, so I just want to throw a wrench in there and just do you have any brief thoughts about that aspect? It is a it is a, a rabbit trail. But uh, any any brief thoughts about some of the folks that will say that we don't have free will? Yes, uh, I will say two things. The one is that um, the, the, we mustn't turn it into a binary question. Do we have free will or don't we? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it's a, it's a matter of probabilities. Uh, yeah. I think we need a probabilistic uh, account of free will. Uh, and, and I can illustrate that in the simplest of examples, Daniel in the lion's den, you know, that biblical story. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, you know, Daniel went into the lion's den. Uh, that's a, a good example of free will. I mean, because lions are scary things. <laughs> um, and, but so, so, the, the, so, so Daniel can go into the lion's den, but the chances of us doing that are pretty slim. Mm -hmm. You know, so on, on, on average, most people don't go into lion's dens, yeah, uh, no, uh, no. even though they can. Right. And so this is what I mean by saying that there are probabilistic constraints on free will. And those constraints are, are uh, you won't be surprised to hear me saying that, are fundamentally driven by feeling. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, mm -hmm. Feelings constrain our free will. Uh, we can override feelings, uh, but they are powerful things. And for the most part, the feelings were not. So the more, the more you're deviating from your homeostatic settling point, the more compulsive your behavior will become. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, air hunger, for example. You know, if you're in a carbon dioxide filled room, you suddenly become conscious of the need to breathe uh, and you <laughs> yes. go wherever the oxygen is. You can choose not to, but... That's how I look on free will. Um, and, the, and the equations that I've uh, developed with, with Friston, mm -hmm. um, what, what I was talking about earlier, the mechanistic mm -hmm. account uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 of feeling, uh, the, they are probabilistic equations. It's not simple Newtonian stuff. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a second thing I want to say about free will. When you say it's an illusion, um, you're, you're presumably referring to the work of Benjamin Libet and, and everything that came after. Benjamin Libet famously, for those listeners who don't know uh, his, his work, famously showed that um, it, it, when, we, when we voluntarily uh, of our own free will choose to move a finger, mm -hmm. um, that he could show that about 400 milliseconds before we choose to move our finger, um, our mm -hmm. brains are showing a thing called a readiness potential uh, yeah. in the supplementary motor area, uh, which, which is the beginning of the movement. It's the right. preparation for the movement. Right. So the, the, the decision uh, 
uh, is almost half a second later than the actual initiation of the movement. Mm -hmm. So that's weighty evidence against free will mm -hmm. and weighty evidence for your, um, I, I know you are not necessarily identifying yourself with that phrase, but you know mm -hmm. the fact that it's an illusion. Mm -hmm. is, it, and I, I think that the way that we must understand uh, Benjamin Libet's findings is that the conscious cognitive declaration, I am going to move my finger, uh, is not the beginning of everything we've said in this conversation points to the fact that mental life starts at a much more primitive level. You know, each mental act uh, isn't philosophically driven. It's driven ultimately by basic brainstem mechanisms which have to do with volition and arousal um, and, and, and raw feelings. So the impetus to act, uh, it's perfectly reasonable, I believe, to... to um, to uh, uh, believe that it takes about half a second uh, for the core brainstem volitional impulse to turn into a self-reflective cognitive thought. Okay, I'm going to move now, uh, and so I think that's that's what we're seeing in that in that apparent illusion of free will. Really, the illusion is that our free will is something which is which is high-level cognitive declarative kind of process. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's reasonable to, to assume it is. I think it's uh, mm. the impulse to act s starts before we can articulate it verbally to ourselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, it definitely the way you're looking at it definitely is a a different framework. It's a, it's a different lens that you're you're putting on 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 how we understand feelings and, and, and you know, conscious arousal. And so when you then map that on to free will, well, then it's a different set of kind of, uh, it's a different set of lenses, a set, a set of glasses, which is interesting to, to really think about. Um, so, so here, so there's a, I want to get to this part and then I think it will lead into one of the other things uh, as well. So there's a part in the book um, kind of towards the back half of the, yeah, of the book where you, you give th three things that, what consciousness is right you say it can act it can change and there's some type of adjustment for uh precision so can you just say those those three areas about when you're trying to summarize okay we you know there's all these things we've talked about all these things about feelings and the brain and we've gone all over the place with animals now all this stuff which is all really really good at, at, at bottom, the core and how you're conceptualizing this consciousness is these three things. It can act, change, and adjust. Yeah. So uh, I need to I need to uh, inform listeners of some uh, some background uh, concepts before I can properly address the the the, the point you've just raised. Mm -hmm. um, let, let Let's go back to what I said about homeostasis. Yes. Uh, so you know. Which is a good place to go back to because yes, that's balance. where it all starts. It's all the balance. Where it all yes. starts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we need to remain within certain uh, uh, emotional and bodily ranges. You know, mm -hmm. certain, they, 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 this, these are our viable bounds, um, and deviations from those viable bounds uh, are the demands uh, upon our minds to to do something, to perform some sort of work. Um, and uh, I told you we are born with instincts, which are our reflexive automatic uh, answers to, to those demands. Uh, and I told you that those are not enough. We need to supplement them through learning uh, from experience. Um, and so we, the, the, the mind, uh, the brain, uh, which is the same thing, uh, is a predictive machine, basically. Uh, it's a, so although I'm, I'm saying it's homeostatic, uh, it's homeostatic extended uh, through learning uh, to, to, to being able to predict what shall I do to get myself back into my viable bounds in a great many, a great variety of situations. Um, and uh, this is what learning from experience is all about. Um, and um, uh, th th this is why uh, the concept of prediction has become so important in, in contemporary neuroscience. Uh, let, let me make sure again that I'm making this point uh, clearly, that once you're in a state of homeostatic uh, imbalance, you, you're, you're not where you need to be, uh, you need to make a prediction as to how to get back there. Uh, you need mm. to act on that prediction. So, so um, 
you have automatic predictions and then you update them through learning and then you have a great many complex uh, alternative predictions available to you. So it's all about predicting, how do I meet my needs? What must I do to meet my needs? Now, if you do not meet your need, in other words, if you're in a state of prediction error, in other words, homeostatic deviation, a state of need, um, there are two things you can do. Uh, the one is you can act. Hmm. In other words, and, and this is what you just said, one of your three alternatives. You can act. In other words, I must do something differently from what I'm doing now um, in order to get myself back to where I need to be. So if you're in a carbon dioxide filled room and you're feeling air hunger, you know, you, you're busy going up the stairs and you're feeling worse and you think, well, shit, I think I'm going the wrong way. I'll, 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 I'll turn around and I'll go, I'll go downstairs. And then you find you can breathe. Okay. So you've got a, that's a better, that's a better, a better act, a better action. Uh, on the basis of your experience of such um, of such um, events, uh, you, the second thing that you can do is update your predictions, change your predictive model. So you know, so it's not just doing something differently here and now; it's then predicting in future different actions based on your experience this time. Mm. So those two, those are the two obvious choices. I can either represent the world differently or I can act differently upon the world. Mm. Those are the two ways in which I can reduce prediction error, get myself back to uh, where I need to be mm. uh, uh, over, over time. You know, we learn these things yes. over time. Yeah. So those are the two obvious things, uh, representation of the world and action upon the world. Uh, both of them are, 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 are how I get myself back to where I need to be. Now, the third option is the really interesting one. And unfortunately, this is a little technical. Um, so, so when it, everything in prediction is probabilistic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you you don't have an absolutely certain prediction uh, for all possible situations. You know, you you have a, re, a, a greater or a lesser degree of confidence in your prediction depending on context. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, that third variable, confidence, um, is is. You can so in addition to changing what you do or how you represent the world, you can adjust your confidence level in your predictions uh, and in the your, your, the sensory signals that you're receiving. So remember, each action upon the world um, that is driven by a prediction uh, is met by sensory consequences, uh, which tell you how well your prediction is turning out. So I predict if I do this, uh, I will experience that. And then you have the experience and it says, well, you know, your prediction was to this degree, not right. That's prediction error. So the degree of confidence that we have in the prediction and the degree of confidence we have in the error signal, which are directly proportionate to each other, uh, that is that is the, the third thing you can do is you can adjust your confidence levels. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so imagine what I'm saying, you know, I'm saying that it's about the same two things. I mean, all we can do is represent the world and act on the world. You know, that's all that's all we've got. But there's a third thing, which is how confident are we? It's a gradation. Uh, and that uh, that adjustment of confidence is what is driven by feeling. In other words, if things are turning out as expected, that is good. Uh, if uncertainty is prevailing, that is bad. How the brain knows things are turning out well or badly uh, is in terms of the feeling states. As I said, that's the extended form of homeostasis that we've identified as the fundamental mechanism of consciousness. And what and what what that uh, uh, increasing confidence in a prediction, decreasing confidence in a prediction, increasing confidence in an error signal, decreasing confidence in an error signal, the adjustment of that is what feeling does, is what mm. feeling mediates. So that third thing is... I, is adjustment uh, of confidence. Uh, it, it's, it's a second order of statistics. Uh, it, it, it makes for a much more subtle, a much more variegated. It makes for the possibility of choice. I say again, um, that, you know, that's a, so we think that the adjustment of confidence. Uh, which technically, and I'm sorry, I just want to make you listeners aware of the technical vocabulary. Sure. They don't no, need no, to. No, sure. They don't need to master it. But just so, so I've spoken about confidence. It's, it's a statistical concept. Yes. Um, the, 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 the confidence is, is rooted in variance, variance about the mean. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you always get the same result, 
uh, you have a high confidence in it. If it right. is scattershot of results, you have right. low confidence. Right. So another word for confidence is variance. Right. Uh, and, and the more confident you are, the, the narrower the variance. The less confidence, confident you are, the, the wider the variance. Another term we use for that is precision. Mm. So you know, it's, precision is, the, is a measure of the, of the confidence. And in physiological terms, what we call that is arousal or mm. postsynaptic gain. So yeah. the, more, uh, the more surprising a, 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 a sensory signal is, the more it arouses you, uh, the more it increases a reticular activating system activity. And, and that brings us back to where we started. It's all about feeling, that arousal states are feeling states. Uh, surprises are bad things, biologically speaking. Right. Uh, 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 your beliefs being confirmed are good things, biologically speaking. And all of this is mediated by feeling, which is arousal, which is which is uh, uh, which is postsynaptic gain, which is precision weighting, which is variance about the mean, which is confidence. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. It's it's that's it, it's such a nice uh, again outline and system of of, of everything. It, it's it's not kind of all over the place. It like it, it has a nice flow of how how to explain these things. Um, and so, Sorry, Xavier, may I interrupt you to just uh, supplement what you've just said? Yes. It's not only that it's, 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 it's intellectually um, sort of satisfying to have, a, to have an internally consistent conception of, of all of these complex things. Uh, it's, there, there, there's two other things that, that, it, that it brings us. The, the one is quantifiability. Uh -huh. You know, when I translate all of these things into statistical mechanics, um, that that's that that comes with the bonus that yeah. you know statistical mechanics have to do with quantities yes. that we can measure, um, and that that is not a small thing in the science mm -hmm. of the mind. You know, to mm -hmm. be able to not just have not, uh, intellectually satisfying concepts, uh, but to be able to quantify the variables concerned, uh, and then and, and then measure. You know, is the is the quantity that you predict on the basis of your theory should if if this happens, then that should happen according to the laws I've discerned. Uh, you know, the, the which equations are just relationships between numbers, right. uh, between quantities. So that that's a very important part of this this way of thinking. Is it 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 renders the basic moving parts of the mind quantifiable in principle, and and then I, the other point is. Uh, is in practice. That, that is to say, we can then also uh, model uh, these mechanisms in uh, a, a, a computational uh, and robotic form. Um, and that's another way of testing uh, our, our, uh, the, the veracity of our models, you know, that we're saying, well, if this is... The, Richard Feynman, this brilliant physicist, uh, said, famously said, uh, if you can't build it, you don't understand it. Um, <laughs> yes, and yes. so, you know, that's that's the other advantage that comes with this this um, way, the way in which we are conceptualizing consciousness within the predictive coding framework and the free energy principle is is a which is all computational neuroscience is rendering these things. Um, uh, it's really raising the bar uh, in the science of the mind in in ways that I think are very important for the future development of of, of our of our understanding. I, absolutely, Abs I I totally agree. I I I I think the quantitative aspect of it is, you know, what you know many people would, you know, criticize other people that say, well, you're just talking about subjective experiences, or we can't quantify emotions or and or feelings. You know, how do we do that? And and that, yes, I would agree. I think the fact that not only is it intellectually satisfying and, and cohesive, but it's also uh, there's quantitative data, which gives you more uh, solid foundation to stand on, which I think is, I, I absolutely agree. Okay, one, 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 uh, one other piece here, and then I, I'll, it will link us to the other, other aspect. You, and you're not the first person to, to say this. So you talk about the three different, you know, kind of right after the, the, this piece on what consciousness is, the, um, the exterioceptive, the proprioceptive and the interoceptive. Can you explain those uh, three for? It's, it's it's a little technical, but but uh, it will launch us into the the next uh, yeah. piece. I want to say as well. So, yeah. So extraception uh, is what has been uh, the main focus of consciousness studies historically. 
Extraception is simply perceiving what is outside of you. Mm -hmm. um, interoception uh, is perceiving what is inside of you. Um, and, and very good examples of an extraceptive per perception uh, is visual perception. Yeah. A very good example of interoceptive perception is, a, is an affect, a feeling. Yeah. Uh, the feeling comes from inside. Uh, the, 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 the visual object comes from outside. Proprioception is sort of between the two. It's the perception of your own body, yeah. which is both internal to you and external. You know, you, your body is an object that you can see. Uh, it's also an, an object which gives rise to feelings. Um, and then in between the two, there are things like in, proprioception is like the feeling of moving your arm, uh, even if you're not seeing it. You know, the, 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 the feeling of um, your heart beating, the feeling of your, uh, your, your lungs uh, um, uh, expanding and uh, and so on. These are these are proprioceptive uh, uh, states. Yeah, the, the proprioception is is the kind of the idea of how you understand your awareness of body and space. And I believe this is on the uh, the parietal lobe is where you know we usually like to think of you know kind of on the top part of the the, the head, if you will, That's for right. listeners. Of how do we understand our? Um, usually, I, I would say it has a there's a gestalt aspect to it, but also a motoric aspect to it as well. Um, and so right. you're saying that consciousness is the feeling of all of those, right? To be well, those are, yeah, the, the, those are three, um, three different, I would speak of it more um, as uh, perspectives, you know, points mm. of view. Mm. So, you know, the subject can look outwards, the subject can look inwards, and the subject can, can move about uh, between the two. Um, uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, they're, they're different sources or categories or perspectives. I, 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 I think we could we could use any one of those ways of, of describing it. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the so I, I don't usually like doing this too much because it it kind of feels you know I like to have you know people there want to to do it. But um, <laughs> so Lisa Feldman Barrett is a, uh, a psychologist. She's written a bunch of, uh, well, she's I mean, well uh, published in the, the journals and has been for years. Um, and she's written a few books. Uh, she wrote one in 2017, uh, How Emotions Are Made. And she wrote a newer one that's you know, very, very uh, accessible. Um, and she tells a different story. Uh, and you reference it in the book. And I was, when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, I hope he mentions her at some point, right? And I saw it. I was like, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, and I might be getting this a little bit uh, 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 fuzzy a little bit, but my understanding is she goes over the standard view of emotions, right? How we understand emotions, you know, kind of all the way back to the stuff we all learn in grad school. And, um, you know, she says that we make emotions, you know, we self author them, right? There's kind of, kind of throwing a wrench into, you know, you know, Ekman's, you know, universality of emotions, we all have six basic emotions, it's cross cultural, we can see it on the face, the facial recognition, and we, everyone loved that when it came out. And we were all like, yes, there it is, we understand it now. And as humans, we all feel these six things. And so she's, she's saying, like, oh, not quite. Um, you know, it is it is very much um, particular to the person and they're creating the particular feeling um, or excuse me, emotion and that they should um, that there maybe is not this universality to it. Right. And so I, I hope I'm I'm sort of giving her view. I'm probably butchering it in some ways, but kind of just contrast, you know, what you're saying now with, you know, a, you know, I would say a leading expert on emotional theory and research. Uh, how do you kind of see it that way and to the best of your understanding. Yeah, well, um, there, there, there are several things to, to say ab about this. I think the most important thing to say is that I do not see the dichotomy. Um, I don't see my and Yark Panksepp's and Antonio Damasio's and you know all of us uh, and, and Merkel on, on, on the one side uh, and uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett and the social constructivists, you know, on the other side. I don't see a dichotomy. Mm. Um, I think it's a, it's a false dichotomy, and one can one can um, depending on whether you're wanting to reconcile the different sets of data or whether you whether you're wanting to fight for one point of view versus the other. 
I, I think we can reconcile the two sets of data rather easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will lead me to my second point, which has to do with semantics and yeah. epistemology. So mm -hmm. let me just start with the, with the, uh, with the facts. Um, she's right to say that uh, every human being has constructed their own emotional iconography. Uh, and that what is frightening to one person is thrilling to another, uh, et cetera. All of that is true. Um, and uh, it's self-evidently true. And there are cultural differences and there are, uh, you know, individual differences. And one person means something very different by the word fear from what another person means. And one thing is scary to one person and not to another, and et cetera, et cetera. And we, and we express, uh, uh, we, ex we behave differently and express facially differently, you know, that's true. Why is that true? It's true because we are uh, mature, developed, uh, enculturated adults right. by the time that you get to have those experiments done on you. Uh, I think of what I said earlier. I said we are born with basic needs um, and that we have basic instinctual responses to those needs and they're not enough. And therefore we have to supplement those uh, responses uh, through individual learning by experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes individualized. So mm -hmm. the, the, the way in which a, a human being in particular, because we've got really complicated, elaborate uh, cortical uh, 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 and other long-term memory mechanisms, whereby we learn you know, a vast repertoire uh, that, that, that supplements and overrides uh, our instinctual, our basic instinctual responses. So in the study of the adult human being, uh, you, 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 in its full complexity, what she says is true. Mm. Um, but when you look at the basic design uh, of the human brain um, and uh, the infant, uh, the, the, you know, what, what's there at the get-go uh, before we, all of this learning from experience and enculturation and mm. so on happens, uh, there you have the basic emotional circuits doing the basic emotional things. It's absolutely predictable. You know, there are things about baby behavior and, and infantile behavior that are, you know, you take away the mummy from the baby, the baby will cry. You make a, a sudden bang, uh, the baby will be startled. Uh, and, it, you know, if you, it, et cetera. So there are absolutely predictable emotional responses at the beginning of life. And then they become more and more complicated. Mm. For me, it's as simple as that. And those, and those basic mechanisms that are uh, in the, every human infant, uh, we find them in all other mammals too, and mm -hmm. they do the same things. But right. now we can't do all the experiments on human infants that we do, uh, for rightly or wrongly, that we do on other mammals. Right. So, you know, the, the knowledge, the precision of our knowledge about what these systems do um, is much greater in other species than in our own. Now, this is where we start getting into epistemological and semantic uh, territory. Uh, but I want to make sure that I've made the main point that I think you can reconcile the two sets of data easily. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not true that there's no commonalities in facial emotion, not that there's nothing there, you know. Right, it's, right, right. It, it, but, you know, it doesn't explain all the variants. That's true because of all of this learning from experience. But behind all of that individual variability, there's still a basic blueprint uh, mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, th that's my point of view. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so so I'm very happy to acknowledge her findings. Uh, and if she wanted to, you know, she would she would find it with it, it pretty easy empirically to acknowledge ours. Yeah. Um, but then we get into these epistemological and semantic book battles because she says, uh, well, you can't take animal behavioral data as evidence about felt emotions. So, well, who's to argue against that? You know, if if if, if that's your... <laughs> if that's your your epistemological standpoint, you know, then so be it. I think the evidence that these animals are feeling like you and I are is overwhelming. Mm. Uh, you know, but but I, I I have to agree that if you're going to say that that is just a behavior, and you are therefore you know you are therefore hypothesizing that the animal is feeling, I, I'd have to say, yeah, okay, I'm hypothesizing. But you know what? I'm also hypothesizing that you're feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. so I'm not a fundamentalist. I don't expect absolute truth. You know, I think in science we take the weight of the evidence, converging lines of evidence, and then we say, well, you know, this is the most likely. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's uh, the, the evidence from animal behavior. Um, 
I'm, I, I'm willing to count that as evidence for animal emotion, uh, but she's not. And then what you, that's, that's what leads to the semantic point. You know, what I call a, a, a feeling uh, or, or what I call an emotion rather, when an animal freezes and flees, it's absolutely predictable, you know, just as yeah. with the human baby. You can, you can really predictably um, manipulate uh, emotion, emotional behavior in, in these animals. Um, the, the, like, for example, in fact, my son, and, my son and his girlfriend are busy visiting me at the moment. They have a little dog. Mm-hmm. You know, every time they leave the house, the, the dog does the same thing. It runs for the window. And you know, <laughs> you know, it's the separation distress. <laughs> what, what, it's, you know, just like with a with with human infant, you know, it's <laughs> entirely predictable what's going to happen. But, but if you're not going to call that an emotion, you know, then yeah. I can't make you. Yeah. So, so she says that's a behavior. It's not an emotion. We can't know what the animal's feeling, and you know th- th- that leads to this dichotomy between our points of view, which to me is a false dichotomy. And I think it's unfortunate, you know, because we should be pooling our insights. Uh, uh, th- th- that's that's the direction I'd like to go. But in all my recent um, communications with her, you know, we we end up we end up coming. Um, we end up striking the rock of semantics and epistemology, and then science can't rule on these things. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that happens a lot, and it's it's th- that's why I usually typically have some kind of uh, distaste for semantic arguments. I just it, it I feel like it just slows conversation down because it's like okay, like yeah, we're, we're we're talking about the same thing. We're just using different words for it, or we're using descript different descriptors. But we we're we're talking about the there that's there, right? Whether you, <laughs> whether you want to call it this or that, and sometimes they are important. But I feel like sometimes people just get really hung up on that, and it's like okay, but we're talking about what's behind it. So let's at least try and get to that. But I I will say just kind of as you're talking about these things, and I, I know some of the criticisms for her is the kind of the methods in which she's doing it is heavy reliance on self-report measures and things like that, which again, from an individualized uh, framework that, you know, how else would you get at that? Right. And so, but there are obviously, I mean, I think she would say this too, there's weaknesses to self-report measures, but um, there's, I guess, again, I don't want to make it a false dichotomy, but it seems like there's two things going on here, which is number one is, you know, you look at work by like Franz de Waal, right. Where he also will say, well, can we know about animals, right? You know, we're always using, you know, one nice part of his argument is that we're using human instruments to study animals, right? We're not using instruments, you know, for animals, right? We're using instruments for humans to understand animals, right? And then the other side of that argument goes, in my mind is, well, you know, evolutionary psychology or or i would say more evolutionary sciences i think is a nice broader umbrella term well we obviously are part of we're multicellular organisms and we're part of a mammalian species and we're part of the animal kingdom if you will or or of all living organisms there are obviously going to be things that separate us and make us different but then there are going to be things that do not and if you want to just have this, this notion that we are so radically different than anything on the planet, in some ways, sure, but in other ways, no. And so if we're having, and so this is where it kind of becomes frustrating of sorts, because I don't know how to square it, which is, you know, well, yes, how, the wall's argument is true. How, how can we test th- uh, animal behavior or their emotions or their consciousness using human instruments. But at the same time, it's like, but is there enough of the uh, structural pieces or is there enough of the, the parts that are the, are the same, right? If, if, we, if all animals have a brainstem, obviously it's going to be different for a different organism. But if it's the same parts, it, there has to be some type of overlap. And if the only instruments we have are the instruments we have, then why wouldn't we be able to make certain inferences? So I don't, again, I don't want to make it a false dichotomy, but how do you kind of see that kind of, uh, I guess, paradigm, if you will? Well, um, I think it boils down to to human exceptionalism, you know, narcissism. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's a very big blow 
uh, to our sense of ourselves, to 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 uh, reduce ourselves to being one amongst many yeah. species of animal, and also you know our own conception of our own beloved selves. You know, am I an animal? You know, is, 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 does it really explain everything that I'm doing? Could can it be reduced to drives and emotional needs and so on? No, you know, my my sensibility rebels at the at the <laughs> notion. Right. You know, so. Right. So, so I think that the, the, these concepts of, just as it was with Copernicus, you know, if, if, if for example, you know, it's a it's a great blow. Uh, yeah. Darwin's discoveries were perhaps more pertinent to what we are talking about. A great yeah, blow absolutely. to human exceptionalism and narcissism. Uh, but as you say, the weight of the evidence, you know, if there's a there's a saying, I don't know if it's used in the states, uh, that, that there's none so blind as those who will not see. Mm -hmm. um, and it. so, you know, if if you choose not to look at the evidence, um, <laughs> right. nobody's going to persuade you. But um, we sold the, the dogs bark and the caravan marches on. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm 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 there. There, are, there certainly are a large number, a large enough number of us um, who have managed to get over. Our, our narcissism to this degree uh, yeah. to be able to Yark fame it was wonderful. Uh, he, he had many colleagues accusing him of anthropomorphizing animals, and he said, "No, no, you're not getting it, mate. Uh, I'm zoomorphizing humans." <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, last question here. Um, you know, it's it's super it's super interesting because we hear so many times i think in let's say popular culture that there's this emphasis there's this just pounding emphasis on cognition 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 all the time all the time right and and if we look at feelings it's very um it's very gray people don't explore it or they have these cartoon ideas of what emotions and feelings are and you know, how do you think, you know, what you're saying is, you know, feelings are kind of the linchpin with consciousness. There's this inextricable linking of sorts. You know, that's pretty powerful in that way of how we then can understand. And so this kind of goes to the practical implication of clinical work with clients, but then also just within society, you know, so how do, how do as we, you know, some of the applied notions of, of what you've, your research has found, you know, how do we how do we put kind of emotions or, or feelings and consciousness in that way, you know, at the at the the head of the table and not just this, you know, pounding of the same drum on cognition, cognition all the time. And again, not not dichotomy. So cognition is important and very helpful. And I don't think in opposition by any means. But you know, how, giving giving feelings and 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 uh, you know their 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 time in the spotlight. Yeah. So the science. Of the mind is is called cognitive science these days, you know, and uh, um, affect and feelings have been relegated to psychotherapists, and you know, it's sort of fluffy stuff. It's not not really yeah. science. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the, the the general state of affairs that you're referring to. Yeah. Now, what we've learned um, about how it works. Uh, uh, is the exact opposite. You know, mm -hmm. as we've said in this in this very interesting and long conversation, um, affects are what drive the life of the mind. Uh, cognition is in the service of m learning how to meet your needs. You yeah. know, and needs you only become aware of them by feeling them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, the 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 popular conception or the mainstream conception of the cognition being where the scientific action is and that feelings and affects are sort of wishy-washy fluffy things that we don't really need uh, 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 is exactly the opposite to how it really works. So that leads to the question, well, then why uh, does it work this? Why do we have this prejudice? Um, and I think that leads to a very, very important set of questions about why is it easier to do science on cognition than it is to do science on affect? Because I think that's why effort gets such bad press. It's because we yeah. haven't got the same degree of scientific precision and instrumentation and technology and et cetera, um, precisely because uh, cognitions have to do with, to go back to the terms we were using earlier, extraception. 
Cognition yeah. has to do with the representation of things in the mm. world, mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can do objective science on it very easily. Mm. Uh, when it comes to affects, you're dealing about states of the subject. Yeah. You know, the, the, so it's very much harder. In fact, science always tries to exclude the subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, the, this is a, what we learn in graduate school. Mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. no, 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 souls don't do that. That's the subjective <laughs> perspective. You know, so so it's it, it's it's really a matter of it's much harder to do science on subjective things than on objective things. And here is the rub: uh, I do not believe that we must adjust our object of study to uh, our instruments. I think we must adjust our instruments to our object of study. Uh, yeah. If affects do play such a central role in the life of the mind, then however difficult it might be uh, for us to study them, well, sorry, we got to. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to find method. This is why all those years ago, uh, I made the, uh, uh, the questionable decision to train in psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, you know, I don't want to leave feelings out. Right. I, I think... Feelings are, you know, you're never going to understand the brain if you don't understand why it feels like something. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to learn about feelings and how to study feelings. And uh, that's what I've done. Yeah. So I, I think that um, the prejudice against affect is unjustified in terms of how important they are in, in terms of what they actually do uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in, a, in any kind of mechanistic account of how the brain works. Uh, however... Uh, the prejudice against feelings is justified when it comes to the methodological difficulties in studying them. Yeah. And uh, I think that we've just got to grasp that nettle. Yeah, no, no, no. And we are. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to leave uh, people with the impression that all we've got nowadays <laughs> is for to study subjective experiences, blooming psychoanalysis. That, we, we're 100 <laughs> years beyond that. You know, we have many, many methods now. Sure. And by coupling the two, uh, you know, you can... You, I, I, every method has its strengths and, it weak, and yes. its weaknesses. And this yes. is why we want multiple converging lines of evidence using various different methods whereby each one can control for the viewpoint dependent errors in the others. Yeah, no, 100%, 100% agree. Um, well, well, look, Mark, I mean, what an honor, what a privilege to talk to you for two hours. I, I, I really feel so, so fortunate. Um, tell listeners where they can uh, find your work and find you online and get your books and all that stuff. So, well, the book uh, that, that was the impetus to this conversation is entitled The Hidden Spring uh, with the subtitle A Journey to the Source of Consciousness. Yeah. Um, the publisher is Norton, um, that is to say in the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, it's available from Amazon and, you know, and, and, um, um, uh, gosh, for the moment, that the name of that big bookstore of yours is escaped me. Barnes and um, Noble. Barnes and Noble, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, uh, and your local independent bookstores yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's it, it, you just Google it uh, uh, and you'll find it. It's it's all over the place. Um, it's a it's a hard, uh, you know. It's it's there, there's some chapters in the book that are, are that are difficult. Please persevere through chapter seven and chapter nine, uh, yeah. because there's 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 lots after that that um, you know I would hate I would hate you to give up before you before mm. you get there. Um, so th th that's that's what I'd like to say. Uh, uh, please do read that book. As far as our two hour conversation is concerned, Xavier, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I I don't think I've been generous to you to give you two hours. I think it's the uh, quite the opposite. Oh. <laughs> it's so nice to have an opportunity to properly lay out your stall. Normally, you have to give these concentrated sound bites, and then you know you end up being misunderstood. So, thank you very much for the opportunity. Of course, of course, thank you. <laughs>